So what we're going to do is we're going to have the panelists speak. I'm going to give them nine minutes each to speak to begin with. And uh, we're going to skip over Tom to begin with because he just finished and we're going to come back to ask questions later on. Now, um, I'm also going to allow us some time for them to discuss amongst each other before we get to questions from the audience as well. The questions from the audience, what we'd like you to do, we'd like you to write them down so we don't have a lot of repetition. We can get to the questions a lot quicker. So we just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll bring the paper and pen to you or pencil to you so you can write the question down, and then we'll get to the questions afterwards. So this will allow us to ask more questions and get more answers rather than my running around with the microphone. So let's begin. And what I will do is I will introduce each person individually before they speak rather than all four of them in a row. Oh, we're going to put the feedback there. OK? OK, we're OK now. I'll make sure I've got them all in order here because I changed the order. Our first speaker is Christopher Reagan. He's an associate professor in the Department of Economics at McGill University. He's the chair of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, which launched in November 2014 with a five year horizon to identify policy options to improve environmental and economic performance in Canada. He is also a research fellow at the C.D. Howell Institute. From 2010 to 2013, he held the Institute's David Dodge Chair in Monetary Policy and for many years was a member of the Monetary Policy Council. In 2009-2010, he was the Clifford Clark Visiting Economist at Finance Canada in 2004-2005. He served as a special advisor to the Governor General of the, I'm sorry, the Governor of the Bank of Canada. Reagan's published research focuses mostly on the conduct of microeconomic policy. His 2004 book, co-edited with William Watson, is called Is the Debt War Over? In 2007, he published a Canadian Priorities Agenda, co-edited with Jeremy Leonard and France, France saint hilaire from the Institute of Research on Public Policy. He is the author of Economics, formerly co-authored with Richard Lipsy, which after 14 editions is still the most widely used introductory economics textbook in Canada. Reagan also has a regular column in the Globe and Mail, and he teaches regularly at McKinsey and Company in its internal MBA program. He also teaches the ADHHC's global MBA program in France, and in 2007 he was awarded the Noel Fieldhouse Teaching Prize at McGill University. He received a BA, Honours B in Economics in 1984 from the University of Victoria and his MA in Economics from Queen's University in 1985. He then moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts where he completed his PhD in Economics at MIT in 1989. So you can see his personal website for downloads on his published research as well as the new paper columns under httppeople.mcgill.ca christopher.reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Reagan. I'm going to go down there so I don't have to hold the microphone and pretend to be a nightclub singer. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Happy to be here. Um, not so happy to be following Tom Rand as a speaker. <laughs> kind of challenging. But let me just say one thing about what Tom Rand said. I agreed with almost everything he said. So he spoke for, let's say, 30 minutes, and for 26 of those minutes, I agreed with him completely. The four minutes when he was slagging economics was the time when I disagreed with him, okay? Um, actually, he was right about some of the things that the economics profession does wrong, but he was wrong about some of them. Um, but there's actually a more important point about what Tom was saying about economics. You could have taken that four minutes in which he slagged the economics profession and the use of economics out of his speech and it would not have changed anything except it would have just pissed me off less. Um, but the point is his central point did not need to talk about the economics prof profession. Okay, It did not need to do it at all. And my advice to you if you want advice is to not actually talk about and not make a point about the things you may dislike about the economics profession. Because I think that you need all the allies you can, you can find, and many of them will be put off instantly as soon as they hear you slagging economics. So just take it out of the speech, encourage him to take it out of his slides, and, um, and go on. 
So let me actually tell you why an absolutely uncreative and conventional economist, and that is me, absolutely uncreative, conventional, mainstream economist can get exactly to the same conclusion that Tom got to, okay? Um, so that you know that, in fact, um, it is possible to, to find mainstream economists who, through a process of rational thought, get to where you are right now and get to where Tom was, which is the advocacy of uh, or the promotion of carbon pricing. So I have nine minutes. I probably just spent two of them, so I'm going to just talk a little faster. So I'm going to talk about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is um, not something that most normal people think about, except every April when they're filling out their tax form, and it pisses them off, understandably. Think about fiscal policy in two ways. Number one is the way that governments collect money and then spend it. That's a very kind of essential base uh, aspect of fiscal policy. Um, but one of the things that you learn in economics is the dollar is not a dollar is not a dollar. It actually matters how governments raise their money. Okay? And governments have known this for some time. Economists working in governments and designing tax systems have known this for some time. Our tax system is replete with exemptions and additions and extra lines in the tax form that are about changing incentives and changing behavior. And if you don't believe this, just think about things like RRSPs, TFSAs, investment tax credits, tuition tax credits, etc. Tax deductibility of home mortgage, which doesn't exist in this country for good reason, but it does exist in the United States. Sorry? Income, income splitting, okay? Like it or not, it is about changing incentives and changing behavior. And let me just say something about how the tax system has evolved over the past 100 years. 125 years ago, the um, Canadian taxes were collected overwhelmingly by customs duties. And the reason is it was very simple. The goods would come into port, they would be visible, they would be taxable. We taxed those things upon the import into the country. Government was, of course, a lot smaller then. We didn't need as much revenue as we need now. But that's the way we, ta we, we raised our revenues, overwhelmingly. Then we had a war, and we decided that we needed some more money. So we introduced temporary income taxes. Long-lasting, apparently, but still temporary, believe me. Um, so we moved on to income taxes. And over time, what we realized is that there were a lot of problems associated with raising income through raising taxes through customs duties. And we ramped down tariffs, and we ramped up income taxes, corporate income taxes, personal income taxes. And that was the first major evolution of our tax system. And this is the same, true, same is true for other countries. And then we went through another realization, which is that there are problems associated with high marginal tax rates on income and corporate income. And so what we started doing was ramping down personal and corporate income taxes and replaced it with a more efficient tax, which, ironically, is the most hated tax in Canadian history, the GST. But if you talk to economists, it is actually the, one of the better taxes we have. But for all kinds of deep psychological and twisted reasons, Canadians hate it. But what we saw was an evolution of the tax system away from personal and corporate taxes toward consumption taxes. And we've seen that evolution even more strongly in some of Western European countries. Now, what we've done, though, is that our tax system has evolved in sensible ways, but it has still evolved to a point that is kind of weird. We are still taxing the things that we like. We clearly like income. We even like corporate income, unless you're an enemy of corporations. But you may actually own some corporations, so you might rather like corporate income. So we like income. We like employment. We like innovation. We like better jobs. Yet all of that stuff is taxed. And we dislike pollution. I've never met a Canadian who, di who likes pollution and wants more of it. Yet, yet we make it free. We have a tax system that, by not taxing pollution, effectively encourages it. And not surprisingly, we treat the environment like a free disposal garbage garburator. Okay? So we've got to the point where our tax system is encouraging the things we don't want, pollution, and discouraging the things we actually want, which is income and innovation and better jobs. And we can do better. We can absolutely do better in this country. We can do better, and I would argue we need to do better in terms of our economic performance and our environmental performance. Our economic, we are a rich country. 
if you don't know the data, at least you just know it in, 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 the, in, the, in the fiber of your being that we are a rich country. Our per capita income in this country is not the highest in the world, but it is among the highest. Yet our rate of innovation, our rate of productivity growth is actually quite low relative to the comparator countries that we, that we ordinarily choose to compare ourselves against. And that means that low innovation and that low productivity growth means that our current high rate of uh, standard of living may not last, or at least it, it, it makes it a challenge for it to last. And on the environmental front, our environmental performance is actually quite bad. We have a scads of environment in this country. If you've ever driven across the country for longer than a few hours, you see a whole bunch of it. We've got lots of environment, but our performance is actually not that good. When you compare us to other countries, our resource footprint is actually quite large. The amount of resources we use to produce a dollar's worth of GDP is higher than many other countries. The amount of CO2 emissions per unit of GDP higher than other countries. The amount of water we use per unit of GDP higher than other countries. We can do better in terms of economic performance and we can do better in terms of environmental performance. And This is exactly where the Ecofiscal Commission comes in. So Jerry introduced me as the chair of the Ecofiscal Commission. This is a new thing that was launched three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago in Toronto. I encourage you to look at ecofiscal.ca ecofiscal.ca. You can download our first report, you can read our blogs, you can see the media coverage that followed the, the two weeks. But let me just tell you what the Ecofiscal Commission is about. It is about using what we are calling Ecofiscal Policy, but frankly it is simply Economics 101. I uh, take quite seriously Economics 101. I learned it, I have been teaching it for years. I write a book about it. I actually think that if more of the world understood Economics 101, then discussions like this would be a lot easier and probably we would have finished it 10 or 15 years ago. Economics 101 is actually pretty useful. So here's a couple of principles from Economics 101 to understand what eco-fiscal policy is all about. Part one of eco-fiscal policy is attach a price to pollution. So here we're talking about carbon, so attach a price to carbon emissions. Maybe it's a tax, maybe it's a cap and trade, maybe it's a fee and dividend, maybe it's a hybrid. But the key point is exactly as Tom said, you want to harness the market and you want to unleash its potential. You want to recognize that the market left to its own devices is not going to solve this problem because the market, what, what will happen is firms will do what they have to do to maximize or at least increase their profits. They don't need to worry about uh, about costs on the environment because our tax system treats it as a free disposal garburator. So you want to um, harness or you know, control the worst excesses of the market, but you also want to unleash its creative potential. And by putting a price on carbon, you will, number one, reduce carbon emissions. That's just almost automatic. But the second thing is, and this is more important in the long run, is that you create incentives to innovate around it. As soon as you put a price on carbon, you create a financial incentive to come up with a way to do whatever you were doing without emitting carbon. And that drives innovation. But the second part, that's part one, put a price on carbon or pollution. The second part is just as important. If you are going to price carbon, you are going to generate revenues. What do you do with the revenues? And here it is crucial that what you do is something that will generate benefits. So then you say, well, what are the options? Well, you can return the revenue through a dividend. It could be equal across all households. That's one option. You could use it to reduce corporate and personal income taxes, which is what has happened in the BC carbon tax case. Stuart will talk about that. You could use it to invest in the development of clean tech. Celine will probably talk about that. You could use it to protect only the most vulnerable families in the country. Okay, so that would be a dividend that not everybody gets. That would be a dividend that just goes to the most vulnerable families. Or you could use it to finance critical public infrastructure. I live in Montreal. We desperately need critical public infrastructure that is not falling down. Okay, so please build me a bridge. Am I done? So I have three minutes that's going to happen over there when I'll finish my message. But that's part, first two parts of eco-fiscal policy. There's only two parts, so you got it all, but I'll come back to some details. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, if you do have questions as well, uh, when you make a note, uh, please let us know who you want the question asked of. That would be really helpful as well. So just raise your hand when you have your question written down. Our second speaker is Mr. Stuart LG. He's a professor of law and economics at the University of Ottawa and director of the university's Interdisciplinary Environment Institute. He's also the founder and chair of Sustainable Prosperity, Canada's major green economy think tank and policy research network. His research involves many aspects of environmental and economic sustainability with a particular focus on market-based approaches. He started his career as a Bay Street lawyer, went off to Harvard for his master's in law, then ended up in Alaska with a public interest environmental law firm, including litigating over the Valdez oil spill. He returned to Canada and founded EcoJustice, now Canada's largest non-profit environmental law organization, and was counsel on many precedent-setting cases and law reform initiatives from 1991 to 2001 before returning to school for a doctorate in law and economics at Yale. He has served on or chaired many government advisory bodies in the environmental sustainability area. In 2001, LG was awarded the Law Society of Upper Canada Medal for Exceptional Lifetime Contributions to Law, the youngest man ever to receive the profession's highest honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stuart LG. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's getting faster. Yeah. That was pretty anticlimactic, huh? <laughs> um, so, one thing I will start by confirming is that uh, Chris Reagan is indeed a boring economist. Economist. <laughs> Well, he's not boring, but when when we first met uh, three or four years ago, I guess, and, and began talking about this idea of an eco-fiscal commission, I wouldn't say Chris didn't have an environmental bone in his body, but you wouldn't have called him an environmentalist. He was just an economist who was defended that we weren't putting a price on something that really caused harm to society, and the proposals we were using to deal with that problem were going to be hugely costful, uh, costly and inefficient. And you know what? It's critically important. He's actually one of the country's most respected economic thinkers, by the way. Uh, and it's critically important that people like that talk about this issue. It's more important, though, in a democracy that thousands and thousands of Canadians talk about it. And uh, I'm, a, as Chris knows, a father of two-year-old twins, and so I don't give up my Sunday afternoons easily, and my wife doesn't let me give up my Sunday afternoons easily. But uh, I was able to justify speaking to a group like this because something like this is what's going to make a difference. So I couldn't be more proud of what you guys are doing, and it's an honor to be here. So let me see if I can give you some ammunition to help you do your job. Um, I know that you guys end up talking about the BC carbon tax shift a lot. Um, I happen to have done a fair amount of research looking underneath the hood of that um, to figure out how it's worked and have some of the numbers that are quite useful in your arguments. All this stuff I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to go through quickly. If you go to Sustainable Prosperity's website, you will find it there. It's been published in peer-reviewed articles, so if anyone challenges you on it, you can throw out that peer-reviewed word, which for some reason has some effect on some people. Anyway, you guys probably know the, the basics of it, right? January, July 1st, 2008. One interesting thing about it is from the time it was first announced in November 2007 to the budget of February 2008 was about three and a half months. That was the design of the most comprehensive carbon pricing policy in North America. Anyone who's experienced the design of a cap and trade system, if you've lived through it, uh, we'll know that it's several orders of magnitude longer than that and complexity. So that is one interesting advantage of a carbon tax is it's actually not that hard to, to create and put in place. Anyway, the basics started at $10 a ton, pretty low, about two cents a liter of gas, went up $5 a ton every year, so there was a predictable slow rise. It started at a low rate, so there wasn't a high sticker shock on people up front. Covers all domestic fuel, so no exceptions, and most greenhouse gas emissions. As Chris said, 100% of the revenues go back into corporate and personal income tax cuts. Uh, and they gave extra tax relief to low-income families. Uh, so it was skewed towards the, the poor. Um, so I'm going to talk about how it's worked, not just environmentally, economically, but also the politics of it, because ultimately you guys are engaged on the front line of the politics of this stuff. So here's some of the really simple numbers. I'm going to go through them quickly. You can get them online. Five years, BC's fuel use has gone down by 16.1%. 
To put that in context, Canada's Kyoto target was a 6% reduction over 20 years, which supposedly was going to ruin the economy. So BC has done more than that in less time. Now, I get all kinds of arguments, which you guys no doubt hear too, to say why that couldn't have been the carbon tax that caused this. Let me go through some of the ones that, that, are not, that don't work. People say, well, there was an economic downturn. Fair enough, the rest of Canada had an economic downturn too. And during that period, the rest of Canada's fuel use went up by 3%. So the economic downturn doesn't explain it. Those of you in Ontario know we had one too. Um, they say, well, it's because people are driving across the border to fill up in Washington State, as if all of British Columbia was doing that. So what we did is we looked at every type of fuel subject to the tax. And you see propane, motor gasoline, diesel, petroleum, coke, fuel oil, natural gas, all of them went down dramatically. And actually motor vehicle gasoline went down less than the other ones. So presumably people are hauling their home heating oil tanks across the border and their natural gas pipes too. There have been a couple of analyses that have come to the conclusion that it is true there are more people going across the border, not because of the carbon tax, because of the exchange rate. It's just cheaper to shop in the U.S. And probably maybe 1% to 2% of BC's 16% fuel drop can be attributed to that. So it is a tiny part of it, but only a tiny part. The other part you hear is, well, British Columbians were always greener. There's just something about British Columbians. They care about the environment more. So we looked at what happened for the previous eight years. Presumably they cared about the environment before 2008 as well. And it is true that top line is the rest of Canada. The green line is BC. BC has always been less fuel intense than the rest of the country, largely because they get their power from hydro, and it's warmer there in the winter, so you don't spend as much on heating oil. But that gap has stayed the same for the eight years before the carbon tax. As of July 1st, 2008, that gap widened by 3 to 4% per year consistently. So something happened on July 1st, 2008, and I've yet to have anyone come up with an alternative explanation for what else happened on that date that put BC on a radically different path, both in the rest of Canada and its own past. So those are some of the numbers. Then you hear it will destroy the economy. And the only evidence we have is what's happened in BC. So over five years, BC's GDP has slightly outperformed the rest of Canada's. The carbon tax is a tiny part of the GDP, so I would never claim the carbon tax shift is why the economy has done better, but there's no evidence that it's had an adverse effect. That's the important point. I wouldn't oversell it. Um, the place that's done this, no evidence of adverse effect. Yes, there have been some winners and losers. Some firms are better off, some are worse off, but on the whole, British Columbia is no worse off economically and maybe a little bit better. Now, as Chris would say, from an economist's perspective, the response to that is, uh, too bad, we missed a really neat slide, but somehow got lost. But this is about people don't trust that government will actually give the money back in tax cuts. So in BC, it's a matter of law. And if you imagine on this blank slide that you're looking at right now, a chart showing tax refunds each year, over the five years it's been in place, taxpayers have come out ahead in BC by $760 million, almost a billion dollars. So the government has given more back in income tax cuts than it's collected in carbon tax almost to a billion dollars. The BC Taxpayers Federation should love the carbon tax. The Minister of Finance shouldn't love it because he's lost money. Um, so it's actually been revenue positive from a taxpayer viewpoint. As Chris said from Economics 101, the answer to this is, duh. Whenever someone comes to me and says that the BC carbon tax is not what caused these problems, you just go back to the first principles of economics, which is when you charge more for something, people use less of it. Duh. Right? It's actually not surprising that when you make carbon uh, more expensive, people use less of it. This chart shows you know, in groovy economic language or a graph the different tax rates on gasoline around the world. And what you see on the left side uh, is how high the tax rate is. And what you see on the bottom axis is how much fuel they use. And what you see is the places that have very low taxes use a lot of fuel. And the little circled part is Canada and the U.S. We have the lowest taxes on fuel. We use the most and the other ones used a lot less. So, and this is Europe. You also hear people, I'm trying to give you guys arguments when people throw this at you. People say, well, Australia's carbon tax was a, fa was a failure. It was an electoral failure because they lost, but it wasn't an economic or an environmental failure. This is what happened with Australia's carbon tax. So this is Australia's greenhouse gas emissions starting from 2002. And with the exception of the economic downturn, you see a blip where it drops below, there's a negative effect in 2010 and 11. That's the economic collapse. Other than that, you have basically a steady use up until about 2012. Carbon tax comes in. GHG emissions drop suddenly. Look at the bar on the right. Carbon tax ends. Guess what happens? Australia's GHG emissions start to go up radically. During the time the carbon tax was in effect, 
Australia's GDP grew by more than Canada's and more than the OECD average. So same story as BC. Fuel fuel using carbon down, no visible effect on GDP. Um, let me just say a little bit about politics, and again, we may just get into this when we get into the extra discussion session, but the interesting thing about this is if you're in Ottawa, this whole story I just told you is almost unknown, right? The political consciousness stops at the Rockies, and the word carbon tax only conjures up Stefan Dion. Stefan Dion never actually brought in a carbon tax. He just talked about bringing one in. BC's actually brought one in. So there were two different elections that were fought on this. Uh, in BC's case, you had a premier who simply got it decided they were going to bring in a carbon tax. He had some good luck with timing. Fuel prices were still relatively moderate. Concern for global warming was high. Um, initially, it was pretty popular. Dion said, wow, that worked well. I'm going to run a federal election on it. He had some bad luck. Fuel prices went up in the subsequent three or four months. The economic crisis began to have first signs, and so concern for the environment went down. He also was not the world's best communicator. Um, and I think most of the real analysis of it suggests that Stefan Dion did not lose because of the carbon tax. He lost for a bunch of reasons, and in fact, Michael Ignatieff lost by more, not running on a sound climate policy. So if you want to compare two, two trial tests, uh, he did better than the guy who didn't run on a progressive climate policy. Um, but what's interesting is the BC NDP, uh, and I apologize to any NDPers in the room, uh, but this is true, looked at Dion's lack of success uh, and looked at the, the mounting concern over a carbon tax that came out over Stephen Harper's tax on everything campaign, and I think opportunistically decided they were going to launch an Axe the Tax campaign to support a carbon tax, which they had actually supported and promoted for years in British Columbia. Um, the BC NDP chose to make it a major election, maybe the major election, the 2009, major issue of the 2009 election. A um, couple of things happened. One was um, Gordon Campbell didn't take the bait. He didn't know what, do what Dion did. He didn't let it be a, an election about a carbon tax. He, he said, OK, that's one of many things I've done. And this is part of an overall policy of taking climate change seriously. But it's also of building a stronger future economy for British Columbia. And I'm going to talk about a carbon tax in a larger context of building a stronger economy and being responsible about climate change. And I'm not going to let you narrow this down to a, a, a debate just about a carbon tax. The other thing that happened is many environmentalists tore up their NDP membership cards and switched and voted for the Liberals, which was probably something Campbell figured out. And he got re-elected with slightly more seats. So if anyone says to you that carbon taxes or carbon pricing is political suicide, the one place that did the most ambitious carbon price in North America actually didn't hurt him electorally and, if anything, helped him slightly. So again, there's this mythology of impossibility, or what Avram Lazar calls solution deniers that we've built up around it, and the evidence just doesn't support it. Um, so I'm getting the one minute sign. So let me go through this quickly, and we'll talk about it more later. What are some of the lessons that I think are at least worth talking about from these experiences? Well, one is, you guys already have it, keep it simple. When you communicate this stuff, environmentalists are horrible in talking about, I'm going to be 6% below 1992 by 2006, and you're going to be 17% below 2000 by 2008. But you're People just get lost, right? So keep it simple. Uh, smart design matters. Don't get into that. Um, but the one I really want to focus on is the one in bold there, which is we had a guy, uh, Angus McAllister, who gave us a talk after the Dion election, and he said, look, when you want to sell a tropical vacation, you talk about the beach, not the flight to get there. People have to want to get to the beach before they're going to care about your flight. And this is a really important lesson for climate policy. Climate policy is a flight. Right? And people like me and Chris and or policy wonks, we love the details of the flight. But you should start with where it will take you to. What kind of an economy, what kind of a future society and economy, why is this better for Canada's future? And um, let me save that for the discussion period then, because I think there's actually a really positive economic storyline about why putting a price on carbon is leaving aside the environmental arguments, one of the smartest things we have to do economically to position ourselves for the economy of the future. So thank thanks. you very Stay much. Tuned. Great. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. David Robinson. Dr. David Robinson teaches economics at Laurentian University and is director of the Institute for Northern Ontario Research and Development. As a leading expert on Northern Ontario economic development, he was the first person to identify and promote the Northern Ontario mining supply and service sector as the city of Greater Sudbury's leading sector. 
He was the first person to propose Northern Ontario School of Architecture and launched a community committee that brought it into being. He also drove the creation of the School of Northern Development at Laurentian. He's written a book on two-by-two -two game theory, consulted for forest-dependent communities, and is working on a book on the economics of community forestry. He's best known in Northern Ontario for columns in Northern Ontario Business Magazine that focus on Northern Ontario and oh, so they're stuck together. That's why. Aha. Northern Ontario economic issues, and for frequent media interviews and appearances on TVO's Agenda with Steve Pakin. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Robinson. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, the economists are fairly competitive, and so I want to start off by saying I'm an even more boring and conventional economist than, <laughs> than my friend Chris. What I thought I'd do a little while ago was ask myself what economists believe about climate change. Can you make some generalizations about the profession? And so I'm going to tell you what those are, because I think they're kind of useful if you think about lobbying. One of them is that economists do accept the notion that of anthropogenic climate change. Why? Well, for the same reason that they don't take out each other's tonsils. <laughs> We're not the experts on climate change. There are climatologists who are, and we take their word for it. And if you have an economist who doesn't accept climate change, there might be a few, but run because they don't expect, they don't actually respect expertise and those aren't the kind of people you want to trust. When we accept anthropogenic climate change, I think we economists do something because we're generally statistically a little more sophisticated than the general population. We imagine a distribution of consequences, not one. And that distribution for me goes something like this. There might be a 10% chance that we keep global warming before to below 2%. Maybe that's a bit optimistic. But the principle of a distribution, there's at least a 10% chance that by 2070, climate change will have killed a billion people or more. That's a distribution, bad end, good end. Once you take the climatologist seriously, you've got a distribution like that in your head. And the only economists who don't have that distribution in their head are the ones who haven't spent much time thinking about it. I think that's called passive denial, maybe. So, so there's a question you ask. Can we kind of tilt to the bottom end of that risk spectrum? spectrum? Well, um, this is equilibrium theory. Any time that you imagine that prices are going to affect the amount that you're using of anything, you're using a supply and demand model, which is an equilibrium model. So, yeah, economists believe that carbon taxation, and I'm saying all economists believe this, or they're not actually, they don't deserve their credentials. This is, as Chris said, Econ 101. We all believe that carbon taxation can significantly reduce carbon emissions and tip us in the direction of technological innovations and improvements. Absolutely, no question. And economists who have are not passively denying all believe that we need a carbon tax. It's not up for grabs. It's simply not, I mean, I know I'm being a little bit, what, authoritarian or something to say I know what economists believe, but these follow from the principles of economics. So if you don't believe the principles of economics, how can you be an economist? It's really simple. Economists have to believe those things. So there's no economic argument against the carbon tax, period. I mean, you can add frills and bells and whistles to your arguments in extreme cases, but basically there's no argument left. Feel completely confident in telling politicians that the debate is over on those issues. 
So here's the big question that I think is remaining, and there is some disagreement out there. If we set out to stay in the, the low danger end, is it going to cost too much? Is it going to hurt our standard of living? That's the one that seems to me to be floating around. Will it make us poor? Well, you know what? I think that there's a huge confusion about this question. You look carefully at economic theory, and when you have a transition to a, next, a new technology or a new set of technology, you have growth. You have more jobs. Yeah, you get some, some jobs disappearing, but it's generally a transition to a wealthier society. We're in the process of an economic transition and a technological transition. The costs that we're talking about or people are worried about, the possible budgetary costs, what happens to that money? Somebody gets paid to do some work. Somebody gets paid to, to change technologies. That actually creates jobs. In public finance, we try to calculate if you spend the public dollar, how much comes back in taxes. My right-wing friends say 60% of it comes back in taxes. That's actually a pretty good, good ratio. That means it's costing you 40% for every dollar you spend. What I think that is really important to notice is with relatively small subsidies in the last little while for, for new energy technologies and other, other related technologies, we've had an incredible explosion of innovation electric cars are on the road. The numbers are basically doubling every year. It's tiny numbers, right? You ever heard of compound interest? You're a conservative and the first thing you teach people is compound interest, you make money, put it in the bank, work hard. Compound, compounding in electric cars means there's no more gasoline cars by 2022. Uh, that's not going to really happen, but that's what the current growth rates mean. You can't see the explosion yet. You know what the most exciting set of technological changes in the last four years has been, and certainly in the last one year from my point of view? Energy storage systems. Little tiny bit of research money has gone into it. Explosion in the technology. Why? Well, because now there's electric cars and you need better batteries. Boom, there's money to be made. Energy storage actually makes wind and solar a hell of a lot more efficient. You go from 30% efficiency or utilization rates to being able to store every bit of it. You no longer have the problem with those coal plants that they're whining about in the eastern states and in, in Germany. The technology is coming on so fast that we are actually looking at a boom, not a crash in this transition. That's kind of the, the main thing I want to say about this. You go through a whole series of technologies, but I want to, I want to add one more, okay? um, and that is your cell phone. I don't have one, actually. I'm really boring and old, but one of the transitions in the modern economy is away from stuff, big stuff, to information. The industries that have been growing most rapidly are movies and cable companies and things like that. That's where growth is in the economy. None of that, all of that is cheap to reproduce and improves our standard of living substantially. I mean, look at the kids. They've chosen to move into that world, right? It's a better world from their point of view. That's an improvement in quality of life with less stuff. We don't have a lot to worry about providing we really jump into this transition. The economics seem to me to be really clear. We're looking at a boom and we can accelerate that process by bringing in the carbon tax, shifting our subsidies away from wasteful technologies, and encouraging the new ones that are going to make us better off. I think the economics are really clear and I'm not sure all economists are so optimistic about that, but if any of you plan to be around in 2050, I'll put 100 bucks on it right now. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, David. I didn't know you were a gambling man. <laughs> Our next speaker is Celine Bach, and I'm excited she's here because I listened to her last year and I was quite enthralled at what she had to say. So this Celine Bach is the president of Analytica Advisors, and in 2007 she recognized that innovation-based industries were poorly represented through existing primary economic research and identified that this lack of evidence distorted the whole life cycle of innovation-based companies from incubation and capital raising to securing domestic reference customers and participating in global markets. In order to change this, she has authored and published four annual evidence-based national reports that have catalyzed the growth of Canada's emerging, emerging sustainable industries. Her research has changed the investment and policy landscape and has formed the basis of hundreds of millions of dollars in catalytic public program investment. She's engaged in consultancy projects addressing finance, public policy, innovation and trade across Canada and around the world. Celine has had an international career having worked in 20 countries, first as a principal of AT Kearney, a global management consulting firm, and later as an operating executive in two high growth Canadian technology companies Solect Technology Group and Bridgewater Systems, both which were acquired by Amdocs. Her current leadership roles include her position as Global Practice Lead and Chair of the Sustainable Technology Private Sector Advisory Board for the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. I'm sorry, Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. She's a member of the Asia Development Bank Low Carbon Technology Steering Committee to build innovative finance vehicles for broad ad adoption of low carbon technologies. She also sits as, as an independent director of Green Centre Canada and serves on the core evaluation team for Genome Canada's Genomic Applications Partnership Program. She's the recipient of the Clean 16 Award, which recognizes her contribution to building sustainable capital markets in Canada. She also is one of Canada's Women of Nature. She's a graduate of University of Wealth and Commerce and has earned the MBA from Bath University in the UK. She is a scholar of Lester B. Pearson United World College of the Pacific and of the Rotary Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Celine Black. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, congratulations on this uh, fantastic conference. And you really, really have outdone yourselves. You must be absolutely delighted to all be here and to be doing such important work. Uh, the work that you do, which is careful and personal engagement with people you know, who we all need to influence, um, that translation work is so important. And uh, I think you, you know, you're unstinting and ongoing determination to make a difference I think just needs to be recognized. So thank you for inviting me and, and congratulations on what you do. Um, I'm going to start by, uh, by saying that um, I'm not an economist. <laughs> but I will tell you what I am and, and actually don't often speak about this. I'm a management consultant. Uh, so my professional deformation uh, is as a, uh, as a management consultant and, and not actually a, a widely understood profession. Um, but if I were to sort of put the what I do in the context of that professional deformation, um, it's really the, the, it's a I guess a profession of people who like at McKinsey at AT Kearney, uh, who are given the task to make significant difficult change in very large organizations, usually corporations, but not always. Um, and I was reflecting on on what you know what we were all uh, bringing to the table in this discussion today, and it seemed to me that I found it. I found myself thinking, yeah, yeah, this is a management consulting project, and I, I, that makes me comfortable. And I, I thought I'd relate that to you today. Um, in a management consulting project, there are, there are sort of several phases. You know, one is to to establish a strategy, which requires creating a fact base, reducing ambiguity, um, you know, establishing options, and deciding on a strategy. But once that strategy is determined, you know, we've done that, right? We know we'd like, we want uh, to have a price on carbon and we want to make an economic tra transition. Then there's a, a period where there, there are basically four or five things that need to be done. And, and the thing is that we're, all, we're already working on them. So 
I thought we, you know, we should just take a minute and reflect on that. One of them is that you typically choose um, to run pilots, and, and so you try things out to show success. And we had a wonderful description from Stuart of how we've had a pilot, it's been successful, and so we can you know, bring that into the fold and how we're going to move forward on a broader basis. The second thing is that you typically um, you uh, change the rules uh, in terms of what gets measured. So in a corporation, you might have been measuring a certain line of business that you want to you know, deprioritize, and so instead you start providing bonuses for different lines of business or different sort of geographies where you want to you know, um, prosecute the strategy. And that's akin to what the Echo Fiscal Commission is doing. Um, the other thing that occurs is that you know you build new relationships because people need to work on different things, and that's what you're doing. You know you're building those relationships in, you know one by one, and it's a painstaking process, and it requires us to build trust. And then the last thing, or one of the one of the things that needs to occur is that we have to track progress, right? And so tracking progress sometimes means, and, and certainly did when I was a management consultant, it means actually creating new. Um, new measurements, like you literally set up an office of people who track progress in this new world because you can't assume that in the previous strategy for the corporation or in this case for our country that you would actually have what you need to measure your, you know, your progress. We, we haven't had that as a priority before so why would we have measured it? Um, so what, what Analytic Advisors does and, and what I do is I'm part of what I call the pre-institutional measurement of that progress and at a specific level, at the level of a certain industry, which is the industry of companies um, and, and the people who make it up, who are going to provide the solutions in our transition to a, a lower carbon economy and who will respond to a, a tax on carbon and other forms of pollution. You may have heard me speak before about the sort of basic credentials of the industry, and, and I'll repeat them now, but I know for many of you none of this is news, right? Um, Canada has a clean technology industry. We, we track it because we think it's important, because we think it will grow, um, and it has 40, 42,000 people who work in it. The rate of growth of that employment is in the order of 6%. The reason we track it the way we do is because it's not... Uh, visible through the, the, our, our current sort of economics um, uh, sort of looking glass. Um, it's a globally competitive industry. The storage sector is one very good example of that. Tom is invested in a number of sectors where we have globally competitive uh, companies. Um, it's extraordinarily committed to R&D. Uh, it's the industry's investment in annual R&D, which this country keeps really track of. We're really good at that. Uh, it's $1.1 billion, which is only $200 million a year less than the aerospace industry. So that tells you just how significant the investment in innovation in global competitiveness is. And, and I think it's also important for you to know that the cumulative investment in R&D in this industry was $5 billion over the last five years, but more importantly, it's the very small companies who are investing in that innovation and who are going to be the next generation of companies to take our economy forward in this economic transformation. The other thing that you know I, I often say is that it's the fastest growing industry in Canada because both the revenue, which is growing at 9%, and the jobs, which are growing at 6%, are far superior to any other sort of parts of the economy in terms of economic growth. Um, now, Chris mentioned something about the idea that you know I would advocate for um, possibly for the clean technology industry. I think from the beginning, what we have been suggesting is not so much you know, a technology fund, you know, that that the, that a carbon tax would flow into a technology fund, and that that should be invested into particular kinds of companies. Um, what I really believe we need is to be able to actually track the, the sort of evolution to the new economy. And so, for example, when the Bank of Canada produces a report, as it did this summer, a very, very courageous report, uh, this is called a discussion document. I don't think they were allowed to call it a report. But anyway, it was a discussion document on the exports, uh, the export um, strength of the 31 sectors that we report on in our chart of accounts as a country that chart of accounts tells us about what we count today and at the moment we can't re we can't see this you know, sort of transformational part of the economy in the way uh, we count things and so we we're doing that 
through our research about these companies uh, so that when, and I think we're getting close, eventually we'll get to the point where Statistics Canada will take over and where the Bank of Canada will have the information on emerging sectors and where we'll be able to p provide the political capital, I think as Stuart pointed out very uh, poetically uh, during the Big Ideas Conference that he hosted, um, the political capital for this kind of transformation has to come from taking care of our families, being able to provide jobs for young people, and being the, the providers of solution in, in, the, in the global economy. So I, I think I'm optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic we're going to make the transition into sort of an institutionalized phase for this, uh, for this economic transformation. And I, as a management consultant, I see the pieces of the project uh, coming together nicely. And I also I have to reiterate just how important the work that you're doing is in making um, those connections, those personal and individual trust-based connections to bring people with us as we make this transformation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Enjoy the list of you again. It's always, it's always great. Now we're going to have a few minutes where the um, panelists are going to be able to speak to each other. And uh, Tom, do you want to start this off? You got beat up pretty bad at the beginning there. Uh, <coughs> sure. Um. <laughs> Hello there. Um, I, actually, I, am, I, I want to start off with, with a quick comment. Um, I, I think Chris is, is right, actually, when he said, you know, we need as many allies in this fight as we can. And, and for sure, my, my characterization of economics was somewhat unfair. Um, let me take a step back and say, it's not actually criticism of, of economics per se. I think, you know, Nordhaus talks about his model openly and honestly. Um, he knows the limits of that model, and I think any good economist acknowledges uncertainties and, and mm. the limits of precision and so on. What I am criticizing, though, is that the chapter in my book, it targeted people like Bjorn Lomborg, for example, who use those models in ways they're not meant to be used. So I think that's a, 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 a distinction I think that is really important because when we put a price on carbon, I think you need to know what, not just why you're doing it, but what is the targeted amount. I mean, what, what is the social cost of carbon, for example, which the U.S. Congressional Budget works on, office works on, and, and so on. So I, I think that, that's, that's fairly, fairly clear. Um, you and I always end up agreeing. We do end up agreeing, actually. Um, but I, I want to put a, a question to, to Chris and the other economists at, at the table, which I think um, may be in the minds of some people here, too. Is a price on carbon enough? If we price carbon, and you can make some assumptions about what we price it at and how clear the signal is and so on, is that enough? Do we just price carbon and we solve the problem, or do we need to do more? And if so, what more do we need to do? David, you want to start with that one? No, it's not enough, I don't think. I think it's the absolute first step. You get the prices right, and then you think about what you do to speed things up, to cover up the mistakes you've made in the past. Among the steps in pricing for carbon that people aren't thinking about very much is we've got trade issues around it. If we price carbon, that one of the big fears is that gives competitors an advantage. I think it's going to take some guts to say, well, we're just bloody well going to put our own carbon price on everything coming into the country. And I'd go a couple steps farther and say, look, we want to improve standard of living around the world. What we're going to do is we're going to put a tax on those countries that have really terrible health care plans for their workers so that we're balancing, so we're playing on a level fit playing field. Canada's small, but if we set that example and the states went for it, the states can basically enforce carbon um, reductions around the world and improved health care for the whole world simply by adopting those two policies. It's almost a no-brainer. The states can do it. They haven't done it and, and are terrified of it. But those are two of the biggest steps we can do to improve the world for everyone. Christopher. So Tom knows my answer to this question because we were just on a panel yesterday in Toronto where this came up, uh, but none of you know my answer to the question. So, I'll, <laughs> And I'm glad he raised it because it was one of the things that I want to come, to come back to. So my quick answer to the is it enough is I think we don't know. 
but I think this is a there's a fascinating debate among economists and among others about this. And it relates actually I want to relate to some of David Robinson's talk about electric cars and things like that. So he's talking about how this technology is coming on fast. Uh, so electric cars are doubling and storage technology is getting better and wind power of course is creeping around the world so this technology is and solar power prices are plummeting so this technology is improving very very quickly so there's one half of economists not a half numerically just one side of the debate that says all you need to do is price carbon you put a, ta a price on carbon, you let it ramp up over time, it generates the price incentives that we need, it generates the incentives to not only reduce pollution, reduce carbon emissions, but also to, to uh, develop and to adopt uh, cleaner technologies. And those people would look at what David said and say, you see, Robinson says all this stuff is coming along, just imagine how much faster it's going to happen with a carbon price. Just imagine you put a carbon price in place. The price of your uh, gasoline goes from a buck thirty per liter, I'm in Montreal, to a buck, you know, to, to two bucks over fifteen years, right? And the that just the in increase in incentive you've just generated to buy and therefore to produce electric cars. Massive massive increase. But the other half of economists say the carbon price is necessary, but it may not be sufficient. Because in order for us to decarbonize uh, the world economy, and if we're talking about massive reductions, something like 80% reductions in the flow of emissions within 30 years, that's the kinds of numbers that we're talking about, um, then what you need is to, is to develop these alternatives, like electric cars, but also all kinds of other alternatives. And maybe it's the case, these economists say, that these alternatives simply will not be developed, cannot be developed fast enough in the scale enough soon enough, okay? And, and, but I think actually, so I don't know what the answer is on this debate. I could listen to very sensible people on both sides of this debate. Um, I, so that's it. I don't know the answer, but I think this is a, a very worthwhile debate. Maybe Stuart knows the answer. Uh, <laughs> smart guy. I don't know the answer, but I'll much in the line of what John said, I would say I would defer to people more wise than I who've looked at this. So if you are interested in this subject, there have been at least probably a dozen of the world's most economic, respected economic authorities have written in the last few years about the transition to green growth, green economy, clean economy by different words. A few of them are up on these slides, but you can find it under the OECD, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, McKinsey, World Economic Forum. I can send you all the links if anybody wants it. Just uh, ask Kathy or somebody. So they give you a package of what's the package of policies that are most likely to transition us to a, a prosperous, greener economic future. And every one of them has carbon pricing as central. And the reason is that if you think about, once you put a price on carbon, it ripples through an entire marketplace of decisions, millions and millions of decisions every way, that if you tried to reach every one of those through regulations, one regulation at a time, there isn't a government in the world that's nimble enough or big enough to do that. So that's the reason it's number one. But almost all of them say it's not enough, for the reasons Chris gave. So if you look, uh, again, at innovation experts far smarter than I, like Richard Lipsy, um, they would say, and Richard studied pretty much every major technology innovation in the last couple of centuries, behind every one of them, this, the internet, electrics, uh, um, even the oil sands, there's a major public investment at some point. The idea that the private markets are the sole driver of innovation is a myth. There is a major role for public investment. Now, obviously, at the early stages of fundamental research, that's obvious. But even at some of the you know, kind of mid-stage investment cycles, as something moves from the germ of an idea through a more refined idea to early investment to commercialization, there are market failures at every stage of that way, particularly in Canada with a fairly cautious capital market. And so the need to have targeted public investment is vital. And if anyone ever argues against that or argues that we're subsidizing clean technology, look at how much we subsidize the oil sands. The oil sands don't need subsidies anymore because they've actually, they have actually can stand on their own feet. But for two decades, we poured billions into that. And it's a technology success story, which has a lot of bad effects. So but the third thing I would add is so you need investment, carbon price, and you need infrastructure. If you work backwards from a world in which we basically have moved to electric cars, we're generating power from clean energy, 
there's a big role for public infrastructure. Both electric, electrical grids are going to be huge. Public transit's going to be huge. The private market isn't going to invest in that. Those are publicly funded parts of our economy. That's not the private part of the economy, but it's the critical pathway through which the distribution will occur. And so those are the three big things I'd say. Price carbon, significant role for public investment, and a major investment in infrastructure. The challenge we face is the big investment has to happen in the next five to ten years because there'll be a lag effect. The investment happens now. You're going to start to see the returns 20 to 30 years from now. And so if we have to peak on carbon in 20 to 30 years, you got to make the investments now. And we have to make those investments at a time of record public fiscal challenges and record private debt loads. It's really hard. So to me, this is where the two come together. Where are you actually going to get the revenues that enable our governments to make a, large, a really exceptional investment both in public and private infrastructure and technology at a time of really tight public purse strings. I actually think not all, but at least some of the revenues from carbon pricing should go towards that. Now, not all. I mean, $30 a ton price on carbon gets you about $20 billion federally. We can debate how much of that should go in tax cuts, but certainly a slice of that should go back into driving what's going to be the most important investment decisions uh, in our history if we don't make them. Sin, what's your opinion on this? Um, well, you know, as a non-economist, I, I wish I could just, I'll just you know, give, the, give the economic, the theory, uh, or as Albert Einstein says, the theory that enables us to perceive certain things. Um, you know, the GDP is defined as having four levers. Uh, one is what we buy, what the consumer does. The other is what governments do. The third is what the private sector does, and at the moment, the private sector is sitting on $677 billion in cash. And then the fourth, which is exports um, or trade. And, you know, we, we don't yet, I think, have, we haven't developed the facts and or the narratives uh, to have the conversations regarding trade. Um, but I happen to think that that's one way that we can help to um, build our capacity to, uh, you know, to afford. And it may also be a place where we want to invest. Um, uh, it, in Canada, you know, we, we don't necessarily talk about it in these terms, but the Keystone Pipeline is a $20 billion a year trade vehicle uh, for um, $130 billion a year industry, which is the oil and gas industry, uh, I should say export industry. Um, we don't even keep track of environmental goods in this country. Uh, you know, we're just now making baby steps to try and understand what our global footprint is in terms of trade um, on uh, environmental goods. And we don't actually invest, as other countries do, in our capacity to be more successful um, in terms of in terms of exports and in terms of global competitiveness. And I'll give as an example um, Korea. Korea is a middle income country, uh, has a very aggressive economic sort of policy. Uh, they have published their decision to procure 500 megawatts in energy storage. Well, that'll help the Korean industry get down the cost curve uh, for a lot of energy storage technologies. But that's not for domestic you know, use. It's really, based on the Porter hypothesis, going to drive an export industry, which will be Korean energy storage uh, technologies that will pr be exported competitively around the world. So I'd like us to talk about the trade dimension as well. Christopher, you want to add to that? Or comment on it? Maybe start off a different topic, but I want to... Can I do that? Yep, absolutely. So I want to come back to what Stuart, Stuart just gave a, an eloquent um, description of why in the future <laughs> um, we need better and uh, more public infrastructure. Um, and you could certainly talk about the need to invest in clean tech uh, as a way to, to get to where we need to be. This is coming back to the, the carbon tax being necessary but not sufficient. But I want you to compare those sorts of ideas with the main message, as I understand it, from your organization. Right? The main policy proposal that your organization has is that you have a fee and a dividend. And the, aggregates, the aggregate value of the dividend is the same as the aggregate collection of the fee. So you're returning, your proposal, as I understand it, is that you're returning every penny of the carbon tax, the fee, back to individuals or households with a lump sum check. Um, 
Those are two very different proposals, right? As soon as you, and I want to get to the politics, not the economics. I believe everything Stuart just said and about the, the economic benefits of having more public infrastructure, especially green public infrastructure, especially as we move forward. Um, but, the, but the political sell then becomes more difficult. There's something, especially to particular types of politicians, there is something that is absolutely alarming about the idea that we are going to have a carbon tax, generate revenue, and then use it to spend. <laughs> because that's bigger government. And we all know that bigger government is worse government. Okay? There are some politicians who believe that. Okay? There are other politicians who have no problem with the idea that you could impose a carbon tax, use the revenues, and use the revenues in a sensible way, um, like Stuart was talking about. Um, but I think it's the case that the reason your organization has adopted or has been led to adopt the fee and dividend model is to avoid that debate. You would like to be, uh, you would like to inoculate yourself from the criticism that you're just about bigger government. And there's a lot to be said for that. When you speak to Carol, if you speak to Carol Taylor, who was the finance minister in BC who introduced the carbon tax, she would tell you um, that it was absolutely central, in her estimation, absolutely central, that the, that the tax was introduced in a legislative way that returned the revenue through personal and corporate income tax deductions and something to low-income people. Okay, Absolutely central in her view. That doesn't make it right. It just means you should understand that argument, and I think you do. So to me, this is, I don't have a good answer for this because there's good econ argu arguments here for using some of the revenue, I think, especially going forward. But there's also pretty good arguments, kind of political saleability arguments, for saying let's keep this thing revenue neutral. And I don't know how you square those circles. And maybe what you do is you start with the promise of revenue neutrality. And you see what happens over five years or seven years. And then you are just mindful of the need for better public infrastructure and maybe more investments into clean tech, etc. I'm not suggesting a bait and switch. I'm suggesting I'm not suggesting a bait and switch. You're obviously my not media training person. people said never start with a statement that is, you know, I am not a crook. <laughs> I believe that's been tried and it was not successful. Um, but maybe what it is is that you you start with a particular policy, and then you wait and see, and you, if you get there, you view that as an a huge success. And then, of course, you play the long game, and you keep reevaluating what you need over time. So let me just give you a, what I think is a, hopefully a fairly quick response to that. I think one thing is what we're really debating is how government should spend our tax dollars. And there is no more divisive or unanswerable question in society than what government should do with money that comes in from various public tax sources. So it's not surprising that there's no one right answer to this. It's the essence of politics, and it will differ for every government. Three governments in Canada have a price on carbon. You know what BC did with it. Alberta actually spends it. The right-wing government gives it all back in a technology investment fund. No tax cuts there. Quebec goes back to Quebec's small carbon tax. Right, but, uh, although BCs are now lower, um, Quebec gives it back in kind of clean energy, home, you know, home clean energy retrofit program. So, I think the politics of it will differ by every jurisdiction. What you guys have picked, I think, is is probably a good a good starting point for an argument. Starting by saying it should be revenue neutral is a good public advocacy position. What I would suggest, and you guys will decide for yourself, is when you get into the the hustings of politics on this, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you find a government that wants to price carbon and they want to use this little different model than the one you're proposing, quietly in the back room say, let me suggest we use our model. But as soon as they go down the road, give them every bit of endorsement you can get. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good on this stuff. And the question that I would like to kind of throw the cat among the pigeons on is, is Politically, where are the main opportunities now in Canada? Because, I mean, I admire you guys for doing this in Ottawa right now. It's like you're going into the lion's den. Um, uh, but I think we would all guess that if you had to bet your mortgage on where we will first see it next, the next carbon price in Canada, you wouldn't put a lot of your mortgage uh, onto it coming out of Ottawa. Um, 
but it's still worth doing that as an investment in, in politics two or three years from now. So I think it's good to plant some seeds now that may take a couple of years to harvest. But where now? Like If you look across Canada, right, certainly last week all the heat's in Nova Scotia. I mean, mm -hmm. Nova Scotia Commission, the Tax Review Commission, who has four pages on a carbon tax shift. They're getting pounded. They're getting beyond. They're getting pounded from the right and they're getting pounded from the left. And there's not much support in the middle of that. Um, Ontario government just signed an accord with Quebec that at least Ezra Levant says is about carbon pricing. He may well be right. I don't have inside knowledge on that, but there seems to be real interest in it. Even Jim Prentice is now being accused by Ezra Levant of having a secret agenda to bring in a carbon tax. Maybe he'll be right. So he does. it's worth thinking about some of these questions about you know, where do we put our energy over the next 12 months could be a really important time at the provincial level in Canada. And you guys uh, have as much capacity as anyone to help influence the politics of that. So maybe other folks on the panel may have some views. David? I actually think we're at a tipping point. I, I've been watching the business press. The business press is increasingly accepting the idea of carbon taxation. You see it on TV, you see it in the Globe and Mail, you see it uh, right across the board. You see business commentators snickering at climate deniers on television. You're seeing discussions now coming out of Ontario. Um, you're seeing people starting to get more scared about climate change, frankly. And I think this is the time to start saying, boy, this is a big win. Get the bloody carbon tax in place and now let's, the window is opening for big technology changes and big economic gains. The window is opening. You've got to go through that window fast. We gambled for the, the current federal government's regime on the oil industry. A bit stupid, it turns out, in my view. Not going to put us in a good position for the future. We've got to switch horses. And, I mean, I would say to conservative MPs, you know, the tide is turning. If you want to save your party, you'd better start getting a few people out there who are talking about carbon taxation and changing horses. Because I actually think that this notion that we can carry this country much farther with oil exports is going to kill the current government. Tom? <laughs> And just re really quickly, in terms of, of, of why it's important we don't simply wait for other jurisdictions and then follow, um, uh, the, the world isn't flat, right? I mean, Silicon Valley has maintained an economic advantage in technology for a very, very long time. It started with Stanford and a few venture funds and the military and government support for demand for the microchip. So the internet didn't come from a garage, it came from a, a very specific um, government supported initiative. But the point is Silicon Valley has maintained an enormous advantage over the rest of the world in that IT space, generating enormous economic wealth for California for a very long period of time. Those people can move anywhere. I mean, it's not just because California is a beautiful place to live, they do have that advantage too. But the point is when you gain an economic advantage, you can keep it. This is what Krugman wrote his thesis about. You, when you gain an economic advantage, it does sustain over time, right? You do have a network effect. You do have momentum in terms of, of, of entrepreneurs, working with other entrepreneurs. Industries set themselves up for long-term success, right? And that's why it's important that we can't simply wait for somebody else. You know, countries are going to be net sellers or net buyers of this technology. That's, it's coming. And Canada has a decision. Are we going to be a net seller or a net buyer of this technology? And that's why timing matters, right? That, that it is important that we move quickly rather than wait in terms, of, in terms of that being a bit of pushback as well. Thank you. Are you going to move to some of the, uh, the audience's questions, you don't mind? Of course, did you have something to add to that? Or? Okay. Um, this is for, specifically for David Robinson. I'm just really, really anxious to see what you can say about this one here. If all economists of merit understand that climate change is a problem, and see the need to price carbon, why does our prime minister who has a master's in economics not get it and choose to fight a carbon fee? It's all yours, Dave. You will love his answer. The prime minister is qualified to be my research assistant with the amount of training he has. You agree with that, Christopher? <laughs> 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 you like so, did you want to? 
Yeah, say something. Say something. Please. The Prime Minister's opposition is about politics, not economics. I actually think, I actually think that, um, uh, <laughs> I actually think that I have heard our Prime Minister say that uh, corporate taxes should be reduced further and personal income taxes should be reduced further. Um, so I actually think that he might like the idea of a fee and dividend because that dividend, I mean you could dress up that dividend in different ways. The dividend is a reduction in taxes. The dividend could be a reduction in corporate taxes. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to make a comment uh, on David's <laughs> evaluation. <laughs> the, the Prime Minister's opposition is about politics, not economics. He became opposed to a carbon tax the moment Stefan Dion became in favor of a carbon tax. It was political opportunism, and in hindsight, it wasn't. It was politically smart, right? It actually became a good wedge issue. He won an election on. He has dug himself into a hole. I think he's now. He, he and his advisors are actually uncomfortable about now. And with the U.S.-China accord, it's become a much more uncomfortable hole because they've been able to hide behind the U.S. in action for a long time, saying we'll adopt a made in Washington policy. Well, now that Washington looks like it's moving, saying that we're going to adopt a made in Washington policy becomes difficult. So I actually think the Prime Minister's in this for political reasons, and they're now in a difficult political space. And that's why I wouldn't actually give up on conservative parties. I think others in the conservative party that may be jockeying for the next leadership role have to realize that they actually have to find a way out of this hole. Uh, and, and I think they'll probably try to. Next question. If you want to start with a Conservative Party, go to Alberta. Yeah. Because I think the door is completely open in that province. Who's our Alberta, who's our Alberta office? Yeah. Good luck. No, no, but I, you know, you've got a, the Chief of Staff to Jim Prentice is a longtime economist from U of A of merit. Very sensible economist. Uh, Jim Prentice is a very sensible pre uh, premier or for former federal minister. So you got sensible people in place, and Jim Prentice absolutely cares about this issue. If you read what he has been writing lately, he is com he's there. Mentally, he is there. So that's why I say the door is open. Another, another argument that may work with the, the feds, um, how much are we losing collectively from a discounted price of oil of Alberta bitumen? Right? Because we don't have pipelines. The reason Keystone is even questioned is because we haven't been proactive about and, and open about this issue internationally. So, you know, throwing a ten or fifteen dollar a ton price on carbon federally as a means of unlocking a social license to build some pipelines and you know, we suck it up on that compromise, that's a pretty good deal for Ottawa, I think. You probably gain more in net oil sales than you would than you would hurt that industry by adding a carbon price. So there are middle lines even for the conservatives. I'd like to add something to that point. Excellent point. Okay, the it, We would be further ahead in some of the things we'd like to achieve, like a pipeline, if we had better policy in place overall. I want to make a point that's related to that, which is I think it is I think it is absolutely possible, and I would in, I would say that it's desirable, but absolutely possible, to be strongly in favor of carbon pricing, and to be a friend of pipelines, and to be a friend of the oil and gas sector. You do not need to vilify pipelines. You do not need to vilify the oil sands. You do not need to vilify oil and gas to be in favor of carbon pricing. Let me just suggest a, a hypothetical. Just imagine a world, we'll just wave a magic wand here, imagine a world in which Canada has no oil sands. In fact, let's go all the way and let's imagine a world in which Canada has no fossil fuel resources at all. None. No oil sands, no oil and gas conventional, uh, no fracking possibilities, no coal. Just imagine that world. Do you think we'd still be importing oil to run our cars? Yes. Would we still be importing oil to heat our homes in some parts of the country? Yes. Would we still, as a globe, have a climate change problem? Yes. Would we still, have a, as a globe, have an over-dependency on fossil fuels? Yes. Would we still have a discussion about a carbon tax in Canada? Yes, is the answer. 
I'm not suggesting that there's everything wonderful about the oil sands or oil and gas, but you can separate your support for a carbon tax from what you may have as dislike for parts of the oil and gas sector. And then my final piece of advice is, if you'd like to be listened to by political parties across this country, I would highly recommend that you separate those two things. Thank you. Priscilla and Bach. Can I, can, can, can a quick I comment, add, David? Quick comment. Uh, yeah, something very quick. Uh, what that last couple comments suggests is that oil companies and pipeline companies would be really smart to demand a carbon tax. If, and that it might be that that's, yeah, they're talking about it in the background. But they go public with that and it changes the game. It changes the game for me, certainly, because my unease about the pipeline is uncarbon taxed oil being shipped out, not, not oil being shipped out. I think it'll get squeezed out by a lot of things fair, much more quickly than people think. But they've got to play the game properly, too. And maybe it's time for this organization to send a few messages to pipeline companies say we will support your efforts if you will just go for the carbon tax now. Announce it before this next election. Thank you. Celine. Um, I'm going to put these two questions together as a comment. The Ontario government is presently offering a rebate of $8,500 for purchasing an electric car and the government predicts that in six years one in five people will be driving an electric car. Um, to add to that question, how much does the government subsidize the innovation and clean tech industry based uh, as compared to the oil mining and forestry industry and how much should it be involved and even should it be involved? Uh, well, in terms of the, the sums, I'm, I'm assuming that the others at the table can tell us exactly the amount of subsidy that's going into the oil and gas industry. Is it three billion? No? Don't know? Okay. Um, it's more than a dollar. <laughs> Why we don't know. Okay, so you see, it's an, it's another one of those we don't track that stuff. Um, so yes, we're you know we're we're all uh, conscious of the fact that the oil and gas industry is subsidized, um, and we're conscious of the fact that emerging sectors may be less so. Um, but I the you know there are the, the clean technology industry receives various subsidies. Some of them you know for example a piece of the VEN cap. A recapitalization of the venture capital industry will go into clean technology. That's a subsidy. So is SDTC, uh, as another example. So are the innovation accelerator funds that exist in various provinces. Um, you know, those those uh, are various forms of subsidies. I suppose there's an accelerated tax condition that may be relevant for some of those companies. Um, the actual amounts are are still you know relatively modest and and I'm assuming they will grow over time um, you know how we're how we're subsidizing uh, the electric vehicle is is an interesting question because we don't actually manufacture a lot of, of the components of electric vehicles in Canada and so I guess I have a little concern that you know we we should build some some manufacturing capacity for that um, before we uh, before we, we we shrink further in the in the automotive sector, um, there are some regulations that that sort of act as a subsidy in Ontario. One of them is the procurement that is going on now for energy storage. So there have been two tranches of procurement of 33 and a half megawatts of energy storage, one for longer term storage and the next order storage. Those things are, you know, they're messy, right? Regulation is expensive, it takes a lot of time, you know, a lot of lobbying, etc. But they do, they're important. They make a market. Um, what I would suggest, though, is that we could be more strategic with those um, contracts. Where rather than just, you know, getting an Ontario company like Temporal Power, for example, to bid on its own uh, for some of those local fits for want of a better word, uh, why don't we bring someone, bring some friends from international markets into those opportunities so that we can build some global footprint while we're um, doing some trials here domestically. Uh, so that's one, I think, one way that one could be smarter with some of the money that we're spending. This question here is for, I guess, all of you, and I guess I'm, I'm going to ask for uh, a, a one second answer each. How many years do you think it's going to take before we have a price on carbon in this country? Tom, one second. From the feds. Three years? 
Chris? Between 3 and 50. Three and <laughs> Between 3 and 50. Okay. Stuart? It will either be 2 or 6, and I'll give you a better answer in late October next year. <laughs> David? The provinces can do it. So, depends, in depends. some sense, we could have it any time. Okay. Sit in. Hi, I'm a Stuart. You're Stuart, okay. Can I add something? I, oh, why I not? Think <laughs> David's answer is a really good one, right? This can come from provinces. In fact, it's already coming from provinces. So there's actually a pretty good re come back to Stuart's question about where's the opportunity. You've got three provinces in this country that have already attached a price on carbon of different types, right? Suited to their different political and economic realities. Um, if ev you know, every unit of carbon that gets emitted in this country actually starts from a province. And most of them start from a city, but not all of them, right? There's good reasons to do this at the provincial level, which probably explains why it's already started at the provincial level. And I think you will see two more provinces, rather large ones, do something or announce something fairly soon. Tom's jumping a bit here. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, I agree. I actually predict that a set of cohesive subnational policies will emerge. Two big provinces will join with California's and Western Climate mm -hmm. Initiative. And that stitched together subnational network will be big enough and sophisticated enough to hook into China's. That is what I predict. That'll well, happen in five years. And I'll give you that within five years too. I agree with that. That's good because it answers the next question. Is it better to have a national carbon tax or provincial pricing policy? So pretty well answers that question. I don't know, man. You, you asked, the first question was where will it happen? That where, where it should it happen? Yeah, where should there, it There isn't a right answer, but I'll give you the, the short history of environmental regulation in Canada is that most major policy initiative in Canada starts in a province. You think about socialized health care, came out of Saskatchewan. Deficit fighting started in Alberta. Most big environmental laws start in a couple of different provinces. They are so called policy entrepreneurs. The U.S. calls it the California effect, um, or the, the other political scientists call it follow the leader, right? It's actually good to have a feder federation in which subnational jurisdictions get a chance to get out in front, experiment with things, and see how they work. That's exactly what we're seeing right now. But what almost always happens after that is you hit a certain point where you've got most of the provinces move at higher or le different levels. There's a couple of foot draggers that don't do anything. People say it would make sense to have some coherence across the country, and the federal government comes in at that point simply because business wants it more than anyone else and tries to bring some coherence to that policy. But if it's smart, it does it in a way that it doesn't discourage provinces from still getting out ahead and doing more than the baseline minimum the national government sets. So that's the way these things usually play out. We don't know how this one will play out. Christopher, go for it, go for it. <laughs> I want to talk about coherence, okay? Because I think we talk a lot about the, you know, the need for, this, is, and typically the argument for why we should have a federal carbon tax is because you don't want the incoherence of a bunch of different policies in provinces. I actually think that argument is mostly wrong, okay? I think there are some benefits to it. I want you to think about um, the, the, the costs that businesses face across this country. Think about all of the different prices they face for all of their different supplies. They pay different prices for real estate. They pay different prices for labor unless they are in a federal jurisdiction and they're at the minimum wage. Okay? They pay different prices for labor. They pay different prices for all other kinds of supplies. They have different tax rates. What's the one price? One price, as far as I know, it's the only one. The corporations pay uniformly across the entire country is the cost of capital because we live in a country with a single central bank, a single currency, and financial capital moves literally at the speed of light. So we have a single financial capital market. But in every other market, they face different prices for all of their different inputs. Why can't they face a different price for carbon? So you can have different provinces starting different, as we've started, with different mechanisms at different prices, ramping up over time. We actually don't need perfect coherence. We don't have coherence in anything else. We are a beautifully incoherent country. <laughs> Embrace it. 
Actually, he wants to disagree with well, you. We do have coherence in lots of things, right? We have coherence in vehicle technology standards. We have coherence in appliances. We now have coherences in little plugs that plug into your cell phone. It was a pain in the ass when everyone else had their different plugs. So there are many things in which coherence is actually a good idea. But I wouldn't. the main argument for coherence for me isn't to make life happier for businesses. It's One of the big reasons that you ultimately get the feds coming in is the perfect world in which every province decides that it's going to start competing to have the best climate policy almost never happens. What happens is some of them get out ahead and some of them lag behind. And what the federal, by the feds coming in is they, they, they basically raise the floor. They set a minimum level of acceptable behavior and that actually makes it easier for the leaders to get further out ahead because they know that the other ones can't kind of undercut them cost-wise by quite as much. So I don't disagree with you on the fact that we have... <laughs> well, no, I don't. You don't. Businesses face all kinds of different costs. In fact, this argument that a carbon tax is economically harmful, one of the biggest reasons that's a joke is if you look at how much the price has bounced around in the last three months, it swamps a carbon tax. If you look at the changes in the exchange rate in the last six months, that stuff swamps a carbon tax. Business face those costs all the time, and the economy still exists. So it's, it is actually a little bit facetious to pretend that the kind of numbers we're talking about up to $30 a ton are going to have any meaningful adverse economic effect. So I actually don't disagree with you on the business argument. It's the creating the space for provinces to actually go further is the one big one for me. So on the Ecofiscal Commission, there are 12 commissioners. He's one of them. <laughs> so just imagine getting the 10 others in the room, and then you give them a little bit of wine, and then you ask for disagreement. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is great. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Just very informative, and I don't usually do this, but I went uh, almost 40 minutes overtime with you because uh, I thought it was interesting enough, and I think it was worth it, and I hope nobody disagreed with that. Um, we do have some gifts for you. We'd also like you to hang around for about 10 minutes to get a group shot if you don't mind. So, if you want. They're just a very small token of appreciation, but in case you do not have an hour the next time, you're each getting a t-shirt. So thank you so much. And if the size isn't right, come and see me. I try to uh, size you up. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Thank you very much. Probably my favorite part. Yes, it was so good. I know. Thank you. Yeah, I got a pin. Yeah. Oh, it's heavy, man. I got a pin, man. Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. That's good. 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 good.